cool, thank you. I can't share my screen until now, I guess, yeah. So um, I guess people can see my screen now. Um, sorry, I didn't get the, I didn't catch that, yep. Okay, sweet, cool. So um, my talk's gonna be on adding WASM support to an, a native application, and the case study I've done is to add it to the Amethyst game engine. Now to uh, manage expectations, this isn't a how to actually add the code to your existing application, but this will cover the concepts that you will hit while trying to do that. So um, it's more at a higher level, um, and we'll, we'll see that as we go along. And if you do want to know how to how, how WASM works or how to write WASM, um, Utah Rust published the uh, WASM introduction videos um, about two days ago, I think, um, which was in their meetup um, a few weeks ago. All right, and this material will be online as well. It actually already is, but yeah. So um, what, what my talk is gonna be on is we're going to want to translate from a native application. So you can see here, this is a game which runs on um, the desktop and you want to put that into the browser. So uh, essentially, um, I just took a screenshot and then copied the pixels and checked it into a browser frame. Cool. So um, that's the vision. Uh, it's quite simple conceptually, but um, to actually do it is quite difficult. So um, WASM, what is WASM? Uh, here's a really inaccurate definition. It's really, really fast JavaScript, like really fast. <laughs> Um, and um, more accurately, it's low-level bytecode that runs in the browser. And um, there's a lot of good uh, material on the WebAssembly website. And yeah, make sure you check out the Utah Rust videos. Um, I checked it out last Friday and I actually learned a lot more, which I didn't know when doing this project. And why would you use, uh, why would you want to add WASM support to a native application? Um, so uh, first, First benefit, um, it's cross-platform. So cross OS, that is um, uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux, they all run it. And it's cross device, so computer, tablet, uh, mobile phone will all run your WASM code because uh, it's a standard which is implemented by large companies. There's a um, WASM code runs in a sandbox environment, so um, it can't access the file system normally. and um, there's also a memory sandbox for um, WASM apps. So right now, if you run a WASM app in the browser, it's given um, at most four gigs because it's 32-bit uh, addressed um, memory. There is also WASM 64, but that's, I think, still in, um, still in the works. And many programming languages compile to WASM. So you can write WASM by hand in the WAT format, WASM WebAssembly text format, but um, if you have a compiler which supports um, compiling to WASM, you can write in your own language or favorite language. So we've got Rust, of course, and there's, um, I guess, the other big ones like Go, um, and they are at varying level. Sorry, they are at varying levels of stability. Okay, and there's many other use cases listed on the WebAssembly website as well, and those are, are pretty convincing. So um, we're going to look at differences between the runtime environment of native and browse and, and WASM applications. So um, native applications, you've got access to shared libraries. So that's um, dialibs, DLLs, and .so files. Um, in the browser or in the WASM app, uh, execution environment, you do not have access to na native libraries, but you, you can um, load other WASM modules. So um, that's one way to break up your application. Um, for uh, the file system, if native applications can access uh, files um, wherever your user that's running the application has permission to. Um, in, in WASM, you don't have access to the file system. If you, are, if you are running the browser, I think you can access browser local storage, but um, I have not looked at that. Uh, for memory, you're only limited by hardware or um, any limits that you've configured your um, OS to limit applications to. In the browser or in WASM, you are again limited to four gigs. 
on Chrome, you are limited to two gigs because that's a an implementation specific limit imposed by uh, Chrome or Chromium um, the software. But the spec, um, but the specification um, is uh, actually four gigs. Okay, um, for networking, native applications can um, initialize any TCP UDP connections, and they can also listen, not just um, initialize to an already listening connection. Whereas um, for WASM apps, you can talk through browser APIs. So you can connect to existing listening sockets. So through XHRs, so that's your um, asynchronous HTTP requests. Um, you've got web sockets, um, which is another protocol. These two run over TCP. And you've got QUIC, which is not yet a standard, um, a not yet stabilized standard um, protocol, which runs over UDP. But Chrome and Firefox do have these, uh, do have QUIC um, in development editions. I think Chrome actually uses their own Chrome QUIC as well in stable Chrome. But um, for, for, my, uh, for this project, I only uh, talk over H XHRs and WebSockets. And for threading, um, native applications, um, you, when you spawn threads, you're going to be OS threads. For WASM applications, you go through web workers, and, and that's through the browser web workers API. And that actually does back onto OS threads. But um, the way they execute is different, um, as we'll go through later. OK, so um, here's the meat of the presentation. So Amethyst is a data-driven game engine written in Rust. This is the website. And as a native game engine library, it spans multiple subject areas. So we're going to go through these one by one and compare the differences between native applications and uh, how, it, how it varies in WASM. And the first three are going to be more difficult to understand, but um, the, uh, they build on top of each other. So um, if you don't understand the first, then it's harder to understand the second and therefore the third. So if there's any questions, um, it's good to pause myself uh, at the end of each um, section. And um, just before I begin, um, at the end, sorry, at the beginning of every page, there's going to be a takeaway section. <laughs> Not fully takeaways, unfortunately, but um, we've um, got the summary of what you're going to learn in this section, as well as any GitHub issues that um, uh, where the concept was applied, or rather discovered. Okay, so um, event loops. So an event loop is a loop that pulls for an event. And here's a really simple and cut down example. So we have a loop. Um, we uh, pull for an event. And in a very simple implementation, you might block until an event arrives. And when that event arrives, we're going to run some code. And in this case, we're going to run it in, we're going to run an event handler and pass in the event that we just received. Um, this um, pattern is generally used for, say, applications where the, there's a windowing library which listens for the event. And in Rust, we've got winit. And when an event comes in, we want to allow the user to provide us with their own logic. So um, it just takes in an event handler and uh, runs that. And in native applications, um, the event loop receives events from the operating system. And the event loop runs within the application that you write. Now, in WASM, it's different. So, well, you still have the event loop, but it's not controlled by your application. It's not controlled by Winnet, but by the browser. So what you have to do, well, what Winnet has to do is to surrender control to the browser. So it, to provide a consistent API, it still takes your event handler um, through its uh, event loop parameter. Um, and what it does is it sends the event handler to the browser and then it panics. So um, just to uh, show you that, um, when you call event loop run, um, users will provide the hand event handler to, the, uh, to Winnet. And then this is where um, Winnet will pass the event handler over to the browser. So it calls, um, yeah, it boxes up the function and sends it through the browser. And then it throws an 
uh, yeah, it throws an exception. So it actually calls unreachable, which if you've used REST for a while, you'll know that that actually just aborts your process. So um, yeah, that, that's how when it does it. <laughs> but um, surprisingly, the browser is happy to continue uh, with the aborted, um, well, aborted kind of process, but um, it still runs your WASM application um, loaded in memory. And now, um, the, since the browser has control over your events loop, um, you need to obey the browser's rules for having your event loop um, called over and over again. So in browser APIs, the window request animation frame API is used to receive events as well as um, run functions. So um, here's a really yes, quick example of how you would have an, a small events loop um, handled by the browser. So over here, we've got a variable pixel shift, which is um, initialized to zero. We want to move some element um, to the right by some pixel shift number of pixels. And we want to, we want to animate that so it's going to go across the screen um, like one, one pixel at a time. So first you have to define, define the, an event handler. So um, in browser land, that's just a function. And then to get the browser to call the function the first time, you call window.requestAnimationFrame and that function. Now, if you want the browser to call your event handler again, you have to, within your event handler, tell the browser to call an, another function, which in this case is itself. And so if you want to have your event handler be the same loop all, all over and over again, you just um, pass in yourself as the um, function to call. And in this case, we are also increasing the um, external variable um, by one every time so that we do know that eventually this will stop. But in your native to WASM application um, switch, you tend to have code which doesn't actually stop. So your event handler would be called indefinitely. Now, um, to translate from Rust to browser code, inside your event handler, you've got three parameters. So the third parameter is called control flow. When you set that to control flow poll, that will instruct Winnet to tell the browser to call your event handler again once your function is completed. And you just uh, use Winnet as you normally would. Cool. Um, any questions so far? No, okay, let's go. So multi-threading. So in, a, in an application, people tend to use um, threads to uh, gain performance. So if you submit tasks to say a thread pool, each uh, thread can run one of those tasks and you get more done within um, the same amount of time. So the difference here is in native applications, tasks submitted to the thread pool are executed immediately. So citation needed means um, I have not actually verified through source code. And um, in WASM applications, tasks submitted to the thread pool are are executed when control returns to the browser. And we'll have some illustrations down here. So um, Amethyst uses Rayon, which is a um, threading library to manage a thread pool. And parallel processing is achieved by submitting tasks to that pool. So um, let's look at this diagram. Um, if you have a game, you tend to be able to run multiple tasks in parallel, so say, um, receiving device input and network input might be run in parallel. And when those two have um, processed the device data or network data into um, your, say, position position form, say, uh, player one press down, you want to increase or decrease the uh, X or Y position, you might send that through. So, uh, similar for network input if you've got an online game. That's all independent of playing music or reading files from a file system or say loading assets. So each of these um, are tasks which can be um, submitted to the thread pool. And in Amethyst, the model is you would define all your tasks up front and any ordering dependencies between those tasks. Um, you can also have thread local tasks, which means the tasks have to access thread local data and they have to run on the same thread that created that data and you've got a thread pool. 
So um, you've got the actual workers which will do the work. So um, th this whole thing is called the dispatcher. Now in native applications, when we run the dispatcher, we, we do it in parallel by default. And when we do that, each of those tasks are submitted to the thread pool. And uh, so far I've observed they are e executed immediately. And what we can do is we have to wait for all of those tasks to complete before we actually resume our execution from the main thread. And one of the things that can be done by a task is, say I'm loading a really large asset, which is um, say maybe two gigs for a file system. I want to do that asynchronously so I can spawn a task within my task and that task will be submitted to the thread pool. And when, the, so even though that uh, spawn task is not um, completed, I, the main thread still resumes execution because it doesn't have to wait for that new task which got spawned within the first or the parent level task. And while that's going on, one of the workers can pick up the task that was spawned. And we run um, thread local tasks um, on the main thread. So um, that's in native application land. In WASM land, we cannot do that. So we, the implementation that we've chosen with WASM support in Amethyst, we actually run all our tasks sequentially. Now the reason for this is when we do this in parallel, so say we uh, submit each of these tasks to the thread pool, um, the backing worker pool with all of the threads, that is um, controlled by the browser and the browser does not give the task, or it doesn't hand the task out to each worker until um, it, uh, it does the post message call from within the browser thread, uh, sorry, within the browser's control. So if you submit tasks from the main thread within your WASM application's control, the browser is not going to hand those out to each of the workers until later on when you've returned from your um, event handling function. But at the same time, if you dispatch in parallel and you wait for those tasks to be completed, they're just going to be waiting forever because they aren't started. So by doing this uh, sequentially, well, by running each of the tasks on the main thread, which we have control over, we are going to at least get the task done. And uh, thread locals just, um, just uh, as the native app implementation. Now um, for the load assets task, you can see that even though we spawn the task, it doesn't, get, uh, it doesn't get picked up by any of the worker threads until the main thread has returned control to the browser. And that's where we get um, the post message from the browser to the worker thread. And here, here's uh, where the asset loading actually begins. Cool, um, is there any, are there any questions about this part? Uh, my question is, uh, would you need, to, so for this different behavior that you are um, with VASM, yeah. would you need to, uh, like, do you have a code, for example, written for native uh, language, mm -hmm. would you need to interleave this code with some other codes to make it like, for example, in this case that you say the control should return to browser, uh, is there any way to like force uh, the controller you know, or, or yield the con controller to browser uh, between the tasks. Between the tasks. Uh, so by, in the, in the, I mean, by changing your, uh, uh, the, the program that you have, by changing, for example, Rust program that you have for the native, you change it so when you compile it to Wasm, it would have what you want to have to behave correctly as this. Yeah. So um, there, there is a way, uh, let me try and break that down. So the only way you can return control to the browser is to return from the event handler. So th that's the first point, which means if you want to have all of these tasks executed by the workers, you do need to somehow dispatch them, return, and then later on, 
resume and wait for them to be completed when after the browser has told the workers, hey, do these work, correct? Yep, so um, it is possible to do that. And uh, we've only discovered this uh, method uh, recently. So um, what you can do is with Rayon, you can tell it, um, I'm gonna send you these tasks and you can tell it either you, you want to wait for them to finish, which is what we do in the first case. And if we want to not wait for it to finish, we can do that as well. But what we do need to do is uh, when we submit tasks to the thread pool, we need to also have something, say a, very, a task at the very end, which runs after all of these have completed to send an event to a channel. And that channel um, should be an application level event which the browser receives. And in the, <laughs> in the application's control flow, you, re you, re um, you can receive an event from, from the um, browser and if the event is the special all my tasks are finished event, then you resume um, control flow from this point onwards. And that is possible. Uh, we, we just have not done it. And that's because we only discovered how to do it um, like last week, I think. Cool, yeah. Any more questions? No, okay, cool. So we'll move on to configuration and You'll see why multi-threading was important. Okay, so configuration is read from environment variables. In so for for native applications, configuration is read from environment variables. You can pass it in from the command line, and you can also read stuff from the file system. In Wasm, you don't get that, so you have to load things externally. So maybe you pass it in through query parameters. You can perhaps um, take in values from a form, or you can. At runtime, query some external source with um, XML HTTP requests. So um, what it looks like, command line parameters, you can just pass in double dash, some parameter name, some value. Configuration files, you can read that from the file system. So this is my logger configuration for my uh, net play um, for my network server. And for bigger um, assets, which you want to asynchron asynchronously load, you might uh, say, I want to load this, but I won't actually wait for it to be loaded. Um, please do that in the background. So um, in WASM land, um, configuration parameters, so you can pass them in through the URL or um, through your post body. You can, so that's uh, post body might be done through forms. And then if you click play, you can perhaps like start another application. So your WASM application with those parameters. And click that. Um, and for XML HTTP requests, well, so that's actually a bug from the app which I want to run. Yeah, we'll, we'll come into that. <laughs> we'll, we'll explain that shortly. Um, for X XML HTTP requests, um, say you want to load some configuration from the server. Um, you might, in JavaScript, before you launch your application, you fetch the file and then you pass it through to the app, your WASM application. Um, and here we've got a builder pattern we, which we created. And if you are loading stuff within the application, so say that sprite sheet I mentioned earlier, you might just um, on the worker thread open an X XHR, send it, and then when the bytes come through, um, parse it as an image. And there's stuff that you might do in, in um, native applications, which you can't really do in web applications. So, so for example, in my game, I've got this thing where I need to check if a file exists and if it exists, um, load it. If it doesn't exist, don't error because that's an optional file. Um, I've got a compiler directive to say, if you're on version 32, check if it exists on the server. And then you can do um, something clever like this where you implement a trait which, uh, for a path, which is the send up library path. And when you call it exists on server, check if it exists in your cache first. If, if, it, if we've loaded it before, um, just return what value we've seen on the server. Otherwise, we actually do the lookup and we do, an ex we, we do a get. And if it's 200, return that the file exists. If it's 404, return, return uh, it doesn't exist. And so, and 
Well, in this sense, we're actually doing a double lookup because if it exists, we're going to now go and load it. But um, this was the cleanest way I could do it in the time ahead. Yeah. So um, there we go. We can load configuration for both our native app and our um, WASM app without too much divergence in the code, the difference. One thing you do want to do is you do need to expose it. Uh, well, you need to have a server which serves things in the way that your application expects it to be from a file system. So in this case, I've just done, um, I, I'm using a simple HTTP server. And yeah, um, it's actually just the one on, on um, create.io. And when I do, I do actually do a directory traversal. And for that, you, you just use the server's um, directory index. And I just like parse whether it's got the, the formatting for bold, which is what um, the server uses for whether it's a directory or not. In better practice, you'd probably want to use a REST API. OK, any uh, questions on, on this uh, topic? OK, cool. So um, rendering. So this is perhaps more game dev specific, where um, when you draw to, when you want to render stuff to a browser, um, we've used, we're using just a uh, canvas. So that's um, something you can just draw pix pixels to. So we're not actually drawing to, we're not actually creating HTML elements and actually interacting with um, proper browser um, elements there. So um, now, when we when we deal with graphics APIs, um, there's something called a graphics pipeline, and the graphics pipeline is made out of made out of um, many different small programs called shaders. So uh, shaders is a fancy name for something which takes in some input and does some calculation and puts some output out. And the thing about shaders is the output from one shader is fed into the next shader, which is existent, uh, that exists. So if you only have, say, a vertex shader and a fragment shader, and none in between, you're going to put some input in, into this one, and it's going to be output into that one. And so, yeah, it just looks like this. The important part is parameters are, are declared with in, the type, and then the, ver the variable name. And the output parameters are the output values are declared with out, the type, and then the variable name. Now, in native applications, it's a bit more tolerant. So all you need to do for the output of one shader to be fed into the input of the next shader is the output types, uh, vec2, vec4, have to match the input types, vec2, vec4. So say the variable names don't match, that doesn't matter. Now, for WASM, and this actually took quite a long time to, to debug, but um, short, the short of it is the variable names have to match as well. So if you have um, back to back far and some different variable name from the next shader, it's not going to pick it up and it's going to say, hey, there's an error in your, your, sorry, your shader crashed the, the graphics pipeline. And so, yeah, the, there's a little gotcha there. Cool, I'll move on. <clears throat> okay, audio. So in native applications, when you want to play audio, you send, well, you send the audio to the audio buffer and the music plays. Easy. <laughs> but in WASM, you want to play some music, you change your build script so that workers which load the music <laughs> a data can actually start up. So in multi-threading, we have to spawn workers with a JavaScript script. And that JavaScript script, normally when loaded by the, by the browser, you get something called an audio context in Firefox. Uh, you get a WebKit audio context in um, browsers which use WebKit. So Chrome and I think Safari as well use WebKit. So this, this is fine. But in but when you instantiate your threads, you're going to have no browser context. So not, neither of these variables will be defined. So they'll both be undefined. And browsers actually 
um, take when you assign a variable the value of something that's undefined, it's going to just crash that thread. So it's not going to run your code. And so what we do um, to let workers actually work is when you are starting up your threads, if you don't have the audio context or WebKit audio context, just set yourself to null and null is not undefined. So um, first you get your threads running and, and, and that's a little dance you have to do. Right now, we just use a sed at the end of building our WASM package, but um, there's probably better ways to solve this. <laughs> um, after you get your threads running, you need to send data to your threads, which are going to play, um, play audio. And now the thing is, when you write your logic in Rust, it gets compiled to WASM, and when the WASM is run by web workers, all the memory that it has access to is put on the shared array buffer. And if you remember um, a few years ago, there was something to do with um, Spectre and Meltdown. That's to do with things reading from the shared array buffer when they are not supposed to. Now, um, Chrome has re-enabled this. Firefox has this in Nightly, which I haven't tried yet. So, um, uh, one thing I did not mention is the WASM apps. We can run work in Chrome. They do not work in any other browsers so far. <laughs> so um, to get your audio to play, you need to move your data from the shared array buffer out into some owned memory. And the thing is, you cannot tell JavaScript, turn, this, um, turn, turn these bytes into owned memory. So actually, let's look at this. Let's look at this function. We cannot tell JavaScript. These are some bytes, turn it into owned memory and return it and use that in Rust land. Because when you return this back into Rust land and you tell your worker in Rust to use it, it gets used, uh, it, it gets read from shared array buffer again. So you just um, begin with the same problem. So what you have to do is you need to define a function and pass your audio buffer and the bytes through and uh, channels just um, left or right, I think, to, um, where to, um, which uh, channel to direct the, the bytes through to. You pass your audio buffer through and within, the, within one function, you have to make your bytes owned. So the only successful way of doing that is to create an array us using the spread of operator on the bytes. Um, put, uh, wrap it in the view and then run your uh, copy your bytes to the audio buffer all in one function. Because if, um, if you use any of the other um, new, new array looking um, functions, these still use the original source as, as the source of data. It's just going to create a view over it. Whereas um, in, in Rust, this actually looks like it's going to create owned memory, but in JavaScript, it does not. So you use this. Oh yeah, and after you've managed to copy your data to the audio buffer and you wait for it to play, nothing actually plays because um, browsers have got this security or other um, usability um, restriction where the user must interact with the page. And so um, to get audio to play, you make the user click the canvas or click anywhere on the, on the page. So just focusing on the tab isn't good enough. And after all that, music does play. Cool. So um, I got one question here from Julian. Uh, would this use more memory? Yes, it would. But so far, um, I have not. Well, in, in, this, um, in this attempt to get WASM support into an application, I tried to go with what works now. And I haven't um, done any optimization. Cool. Um, any more questions? None. Oh, there is one thing I do want to show you. Um, because we go through so many, um, oh, we go through a lot of um, translations. Music also only plays when the main thread returns, I believe. And you can see that in here. Um, oh, I did not load it if this tab crashes. 
Okay, um, I'll show you a bit later, but um, when when audio plays, it's actually a bit delayed. So it's probably because we take too long to um, like copy things back and forth. And wait for it to move. Is that working? Okay, here we go. So um, this part is, I guess, the um, fun part about um, adding WASM support to an application, because if you can make your WASM application within a browser tab talked to other programs, so let's say you have got a game and you want to play with your friends, you don't have to start a client. You just open a new tab, right? You just click a link, and you're going to play with your friends. So this part is actually pretty fun to play with. So for native applications, when you want to send messages, so you want to initiate a connection to someone who's already listening, you just open it and you send data. And that's like simple, it just works. And for receiving messages um, to connections which you, which you have opened, so um, you're not the one listening in the first place, you initiate it and this is when someone's replying. Um, between frames of a, um, an application which runs in an events loop, um, between frames, whatever the network socket has received um, in packets, it's going to be queued. And when your frame ticks over, we're going to release all of those packets and, and we can process them um, however, however we want to. So it's quite easy. It's, it's just buffered by a queue and we, we don't really need to code anything. We just say um, iterate over the packets which came through since, uh, since we last checked. In WASM, it's a bit more difficult. So um, if you retain your native applications, TCP and UDP code, the application doesn't crash, but um, in the browser console, it'll just log that. It's not implemented and it's a no op. But if you are going to send messages, you can send them through um, the WebSocket API, which means the thing listening to you must also talk web, uh, must also talk in the WebSocket protocol. So um, yes, we also go through the shared array buffer when we talk to, well, when we need to um, send information to a WebSocket. And the WebSocket does not like our um, bytes that we want to send to be in the shared array buffer. So we, we do the same um, clone dance with um, audio as um, we do here. So um, yeah, we, we just uh, send a WebSocket through to JavaScript, uh, JavaScript land, the bytes that we want to send, um, uh, own it, and then send it through the WebSocket. And, and then the message is sent when the main thread returns again. So receiving messages is much more complicated. So the browser does things with callbacks. So um, when you want to do something when a message is received, you have to prepare that uh, logic when you create the WebSocket. So, um, what we do is um, when you create a WebSocket, you create a closure as well and say, on message, do some logic. Now, um, in the browser, when you first receive um, some, uh, some data from the internet, so a response from the server that you've connected to, it's going to fire an onload, sorry, it's going to fire an on message event. And in the on message event, we need to create another um, callback which says, all right, now I know that I'm receiving data. Let me use a file reader to, re to read all of those data into, say, a blob. And the file reader is going to do that asynchronously. So for your application to actually have a full packet, you need to create another callback, um, which is the unload, unload callback. So when the file reader unload is uh, fired, that's when we've got a full packet. We need to send it back through to RESTLAN, so we use a channel. So th that channel must be spawned before any of this was created. And um, so when you create a WebSocket, you pass through the channel transmitter and you pass it through 
this callback to that callback and that callback sends it through. And then your um, REST application is going to receive from the receiving end of the channel. And that's your queue. And um, this is a little bit um, complicated in code because um, you create closures and you tell Rust to leak the memory and that memory is sent to the browser. So you, if you keep creating closures every loop, you're going to create a memory um, problem, which you don't want to do. So ideally, you create one closure and that closure can be used uh, repetitively throughout the lifecycle of the application. And again, when we tick over the frame, we just read the packets that came through. Any questions so far? Okay, I see there's two things. So how big is the Amethyst Wasm binary once built? So um, on a small application like Pong, it's 4.5 megs, which is kind of big for something you want to just load in the tab. But uh, I believe you can strip that down. I tried to use the Wasm bind, gen sorry, the Wasm tools like um, Wasm opt, I think, and it seg faulted when I told it to decrease, well, like <laughs> process my Wasm file. Um, otherwise, um, there's techniques which they list on the Rust Wasm book, which say if you don't have any panics, you're going to remove the panic code, which is um, nice. You can also use Twiggy, which is a tool which profiles what is taking space within your Wasm blob. So, like, It'll tell you this function is how many um, bytes, I think. Mm, next question. What about using WebRTC? Yes, you can use WebRTC. I have not tried. Um, it was listed as one of the options. I, I just took whatever looked um, easy to implement. And if you do want to um, look at the code, um, unfortunately, I didn't link it at the bottom. There might be one up here. Yep. So um, this, this issue at the top will um, bring you to a, a GitHub issue, and then there should be some PR links, I think, like this one. Yeah. So if you follow through to this, it's, it's a beast of a um, module. Because <laughs> um, mixing synchronous logic and asynchronous logic um, is quite messy. Okay. Um, Nice comment. And is the extra copy clone and sending a message needed? Um, it's needed not because you're sending it to a different um, thread, I think, but it's needed because web workers, um, when you use WASM, web workers will be reading from the shared array buffer and the, the um, web socket does not want shared, um, it doesn't want a view of, of the memory. It wants to own the memory. Does that answer the question? Hey, so uh, that was actually uh, also my question. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Um, I just can't find who's talking. Ah, uh, it's uh, oh, yeah, there you go. I see, I see, find you. Yeah, so, um, in Rust, you manage memory manually, and uh, JavaScript has garbage collection, collection right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's why probably you have to copy the data. I mean, sometimes you can, especially when you pass the data from JavaScript to Rust, you probably, you could run into issue if you pass the data, which is, you know, uh, owned by the JavaScript, and you pass it into Rust, and uh, possibly free the data uh, free the memory there. So, and in JavaScript, the uh, garbage collector may realize actually, or maybe even another example that the garbage collector run and try to destroy your memory when in Rust you tr still try to access it, right? Mm. Yeah, so, true. Uh, yeah. So yeah. that was the... my question. How do you manage, how do you manage to uh, pass the data between those two different, uh, you no know, memory <laughs> management? Okay, scheme. I shall actually show you. It's it's pretty ugly. <laughs> um, network. What's this? I think. Um, I'll make this big. If we find forget. Yep. So, um, down. So 
here we create callbacks and the callback will do some logic. And then when we create that callback, we want to register it with the WebSocket, which we are going to give to um, the browser. And so because that WebSocket is, um, sorry, because the callback is going to be some, somewhat owned by the browser, we don't want Rust to delete it when we go out of scope here. Yeah. Whereas, um, uh, yeah, so we call forget on that. And that means um, Rust will not clear it, clear it up when we um, go out of scope. And uh, now the browser okay. will have it because we've actually set the on message to, to the pointer, I think, there. So I think that partially um, alludes to Julian's question about no pointers. There are pointers, but we don't really um, have that in our syntax. Cool. Um, let's go back to how we think. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there might be a security angle. There might be a security angle. I have not uh, thought about that very much. <laughs> All right. Um, any more questions about this part? None. All right, so um, I'm going to give you a quick demo of um, something, um, well, of what came out of the project. So on the left was the screenshot which I forged. So this is fake. And here is a screenshot of the real thing. Um, so you can see the color is a bit off. Um, that's to do with loading color, well, loading images and the texture format is not correctly mapped. Um, it's actually pretty difficult to figure out what is the thing that's causing it to be incorrectly interpreted. But um, when you find it, it's usually an easy fix. So it's just hard to find in the first place. So to, um, to actually see that live, um, that's what that was created for in the first place. For some reason, it did not actually load, and I'm quite sad. All right, while that's loading, I'm going to do I'm going to run the native version. So we can see on the left here is my native app. On the right, I've got a session server that's going to link to two game clients together. And on the bottom right, we've got a HTTP server. And you can see that um, the same files are loaded multiple times. That's for the web workers. But yeah, there, there's a, an outstanding issue to solve. And otherwise, it's also loading other configuration. So this is the native app. I'm going to just check that this guy. Nah, it crashes sometimes, and that's something we haven't fixed. And it's somehow linked to this because I started that window through the form in this book. It's more stable. Um, it's more stable on this on smaller apps, and we do want to. Um, get it working on Firefox as well as on Windows. So on Windows, it, the crashes happen more frequently. Okay, so for the native app, this one. Just checking. And one thing we can see is, oh, yeah, it's loaded. Um, the console um, is a really, well, it's a good place to look for information. And the thing about the this app, it's pretty big. It's, um, say, so it's got 75 lines of code, so, so 75,000 lines of code, so it's non-trivial. And this is not including Amethyst. So this this is just a game, and Amethyst itself is about 50,000 lines of code. So if we use the browser client and we join what we had before, which is abq. You can see that um, now both clients um, see the same waiting room and start it. And I do want to show you the audio lag. So if you watch the left, oh, this, this one, this window carefully. So when I uh, tap um, 
well, when I'm going to press a button and the sound will appear about half a, will do about half a second later than the, when the button is pressed. So do you hear two, um, did you hear two beeps? The first beep is probably actually from the native app. So yeah, so if I press the a button on the native app, it's going to play the audio immediately. Whereas if I play the sound on the native, sorry, on the web app, it's going to be about half a second later. Yeah. And yeah, it, it just, just works. Yeah. And we're going to close this because it's distracting. <laughs> All right. Um, could those crashes be to do with Windows not handling the sandboxing? Um, so the logs from the browser, if you are lucky enough to have logs, um, it, there is something to do with the WASM memory stack being corrupted. And there is an open issue on GitHub, which is actually active when, um, so when you have a WASM function, which returns a result T and a JavaScript value for the error, sometimes that causes the stack to be um, made invalid, and then the yeah the, the tab just crashes. Um, there's there's um, some discussion in there with proposed ways to solve that, but um, it's still a long way off. Okay, um, I think we should move on. Um, if you do want to look at the video, this is a more a complete demo which I recorded earlier. All right, so worth mentioning. So um, to uh, add WASM support to a project, it's actually good to track your progress with an end-to-end -end project. It helps you um, discover and prioritize what issues need to be done to actually test the feasibility. So you don't spend like, like say three weeks just fixing the graphics, which have like pixel issues. We, we did actually have pixel issues. Um, early on, but we just worked on that enough to get ourselves to see something. So um, here's um, kind of a short timeline with, um, with how this project went. So the first week, we just got it to compile. So we got oh, Amethyst, which is the library, and Pong Wasm to compile with Wasm Pack. Week two, we could see something, and it only want, runs one frame before it crashes. Then week three, we got something to move. Um, so the end-to-end -end bit was um, we could actually see that it works in a consumer app. So if we just worked on Amethyst itself and tested it with small, um, small examples, we wouldn't be able to see whether, um, whether we're targeting the right issues to solve. And week four, we got audio working. But um, yeah, week four, we still at the crash, which you'll see. Snap. Yeah, so um, that crash is still something we haven't solved. And oh, here, here's a little fun thing. Um, we had this UI coordinates issue. And the thing was the canvas width is 800 by 600, but um, the UI coordinates were calculated based on a canvas width of 640 by 480. So I was trying to figure out where um, the canvas was being set to 640 for its width. Then can anyone think what, 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 in position A, B, C, or D, where was 640 called? Where, where was the set attribute 640 called? Well, I guess <laughs> the, obvious, the obvious thing would be C, right? Because if you're reading something and it returns 800, you read it next time, and it's 640, then, um, then, well, obviously between these two calls, that's where the set attribute 640 um, was invoked. But in actuality, it was called at position B. So with was 800, someone called set attribute with 640. I read it again. I, I didn't know that this was um, where it was called. I saw 800 here. And then I saw 640 here, and I spent ages looking between here, where where was 640, <laughs> and it never it never showed up. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll answer these questions soon. So thing is, um, 
after this was called interacting with the GPU device which the browser gave back to you. For some reason that um, caused the effect of this to finally take place. But all of this code was synchronous, so that's what made it um, difficult as well. There was nothing to do, there's nothing to indicate that it was um, being sent through events. And um, let's see, um, how many developers? So like two, like does myself, and there was one person called um, Intel. Um, actually, I'll get to that in the next point. So um, in the first week, it was just myself. Um, and what I did in the first week was to try and make it easy for people to work on issues. But the thing was, every issue was difficult. There, was, there were no good starter issues. And so um, what was fortunate was someone called Chemistry, or Intel is his other username. Um, he got us through the multi-threading issue because uh, we didn't understand the event loop um, and the multi-threading uh, task being sent through the event, uh, through the eventing system at that point. So he got us through that. And, um, and so from then on, it was myself and him for a few weeks. And in the fourth week, um, we finally managed to create easy issues. And within a day of posting those good started issues, they were like fixed by somebody new. And well, that's that the only time we got someone else to work on the project as well. And so the, I guess moral here is to try and create an environment which is where it is easy to help. So don't try to incentivize the end goal, but incentivize them um, like th this is something you can do to contribute. Okay, so um, yeah, the the stack priority thing. I'm not sure actually. So yeah, um, the person who gave the Utah Rust um, talk probably can figure that out, um, Casey. Uh, oh yes, um, worth mentioning. Um, if you have the option to begin um, creating it an application from scratch, it's it's better to do that instead of retrofitting Wasm support into an existing large application. Because um, if your application is designed to be executed with synchronous logic, it's really hard to uh, retrofit the asynchronous event handling model into that application. So um, like the network um, packet receiving logic, we had to just keep calling callbacks and at the end, um, send it through a channel. It's kind of messy. And I know this talk does not have much code um, in terms of what, what do you have to do to your build scripts? What do you have to do to your crates to make it work? But there will be a report written within the next week to um, explain all of this, as well as links to the PRs um, and the forks of the repositories we created and what made it back into the upstream repositories and any future work to polish up the project. Okay, um, then there's some links here. If you want to uh, check out, I guess the top level places where we um, worked on. There are some other links which are not included such as the forks, but then um, those will be in the report again. Okay, any questions? Okay, so cool guys, and thanks for listening, and I guess we'll get into the